the story is told about a doorman at Broadway who had worked for 50 years at Broadway. Just kind of picture this. Anybody here been to Broadway? Um, okay, there we go. And this guy worked there through all of these shows that went uh, show after show after show, debut after debut, some of the world-renowned Broadway shows that took place there. And, and finally, after 50 years, the guy was retiring. And so they had this big to-do for this guy retiring after 50 years from Broadway. And so everybody was there at this specific one uh, retirement party, and reporters were there. And one reporter came up and said to this doorman at Broadway after 50 years, he said, he said, tell me which your favorite bro what, which was your favorite Broadway performance? You know, which one could, could you not get enough of? What music did you like the most? And the guy just kind of stared blankly at the reporter and said, I, I don't know. I, I don't guess I have one. And, they, uh, and, then, and then the reporter said, well, surely you want to tell me wh which one did you really enjoy? And the, uh, and the doorman said, truth is, is I never went in. I was always outside here at the door. And the reporter said, you, you mean to tell me you never went into any of the shows? And the guy said, no, I never went in. And, 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 and the whole point is, is the guy is there at Broadway working the door for 50 years, never once going into any of the performances. And I think to myself, I wonder whether or not that's also the story of church sometimes whether we have people that are doing things, that are serving, that, that are occupying themselves, but never fully entering into everything Jesus wants them to have, and never fully going in. And I think this is the case for many of us. I know I I've been a pastor. Uh, before without really fully entering into everything God wants. And here I am on the outside and I'm wondering why I'm getting upset and worried and why I'm getting anxious on the inside because I'm so busy doing that I forget to be. I forget to be in the presence of Jesus. I forget to spend time there. And, and because of that, it takes a toll on me. And I've been in ministry before where it then takes a toll on ministry. And maybe you can say the same thing. Because I think in church so often, we, we, we don't put boundaries on people. We have to put the boundaries on ourselves. And if we are out of balance, we end up on the door, never going in. We end up doing, never really being. And we, end up, uh, and, and we end up a mess, and we wonder, why am I burned out? Why am I struggling? Today, as we look at today's passage, we're going to be looking at one woman who is, well, forever at the door, serving and doing, and never really goes in, and because of that, struggles all the way through. And then her sister, who does go in and spends time at Jesus' feet over and over and over again, and it's drastically different. And these, uh, and these two women, their names are Mary and Martha. We're going to be looking at them today. And, and what I've done, because we're in the last miracle of this miracle series, and we're in John chapter 11 today, I decided to go back and backtrack and find out everything about Mary and Martha to bring it, and let's focus on these two, Mary and Martha, the sisters, uh, really who were right there integral in this last miracle, the raising of their brother Lazarus from the dead. And let's answer the question, uh, am I like Martha uh, or am I more like Mary? You know, what do I then need to do today? What is my next step today? So we're going to be looking at three things. We're going to be looking at sitting at the feet of Jesus, falling at the feet of Jesus, and worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Mary does them all. Martha does none. So let's take a look at Mary and Martha. To, to go back and to pick up, instead of starting in John 11, I'm going to start in Luke chapter 10, where it's the first time we see Mary and Martha together. And Luke tells us of this exchange, and it's all about sitting at the feet of Jesus. Listen to Luke 10, beginning halfway through verse 38. Martha opened her home to Jesus. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Now, sitting at Jesus' feet means two things. First of all, it means that she's a disciple. Yes, women were discipled by Jesus. And it means that she is a disciple of Jesus. It means that she is learning from Jesus. But secondly, it means that <clears throat> instead of busying herself, she's actually sitting and listening and drinking in everything that Jesus has to say. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And so basically, the only reason she goes to Jesus is to apply pressure on her sister. Well, that's a problem in itself. Verse 41, Martha, Martha, Jesus says, 
you are worried and upset about so many things, but few of them are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So Mary sits at the feet of Jesus, and she's drinking in everything that Jesus says, and she's taking in every word, and those words are like life given to her. And she is there at the feet. And then Martha, she's got Jesus in her very home. He is there And all she can do is worry about things that need to be done. And she's going about her to-do list, busily trying to take care of things. And notice the three words that are used about her. She's worried, she's distracted, she's upset. When you and I don't spend time at the feet of Jesus, we're going to end up like Martha, worried, distracted, and upset. Distracted because Jesus is in our very presence. He's actually in our home, and our eyes are on our to-do list instead of on him. That's not good. I mean, that, 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 you know, we're, we're out of balance already. Talk about living life out of balance, you know? We would rather work on our to-do list than spend time with Jesus. There's a problem with that already. She's distracted, but she's worried also. She's worried that, that, that her to-do list isn't going to get done. Uh, and so here she is frustrated and worried and anxious, and then she's upset. In fact, in her, in her anger, she goes to Jesus. The only reason she goes to Jesus is to apply pressure on her sister because she wants Mary to be driven by the tyranny of the urgent as much as she is driven by the tyranny of the urgent. You see, this is what happens to us. If you and I get in task mode, and we get in task mode where all we see is this, and we fail to spend time at the feet of Jesus, we start getting worried. We start getting distracted, and we start getting upset with others. How can we tell if we're in task mode and we're a little more like Mary at this time, or Martha at this time than like Mary? We're pointing fingers at others saying, why aren't they doing what I'm doing? You know, th- th- this, this happens. It does. It happens in churches. You know, I, have, I hate to admit it, but in churches so often we create Marthas. We, we put people into acts of service and, and, and we don't help them because we can't help anybody boundary themselves. We have to each boundary ourselves. And, and, and we allow people to get involved in acts of service, and they end up doing and doing and doing and doing, and they fail to be. And, and they're wondering why they're burned out. And they're wondering why, you know, what, what, why do I feel this way? What, why, why, am, why do I feel like I'm a, I'm a rat in a wheel, you know? And it, it's because we're failing to spend time at the feet of Jesus. Mary is at the feet of Jesus. Martha is busy, and in her busyness is out of balance. N- notice what Jesus says to Martha, and it's very tender. Martha, Martha. He, he, he speaks her name twice on purpose. It, it's, a, it's a way of really expressing Uh, Love, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. You've got your entire to-do list in your head, Martha. You are fully in task mode, full-on task mode, and and you, you are like that Energizer bunny. It keeps going and going and going. You're worried about so many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, you've got your to-do list, but there's only one thing that's really important, and Mary has chosen what is better. Notice what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Martha, Martha, you've got so many things going on in your head, but there's one thing that you need, and that's to sit at my feet. It's to be there. It's to learn from me. You know, you and I, how do we end up sitting, you and I, at Jesus' feet? He's not right here with us, not, not, not where we can bodily see him. How do we sit at his feet? Jesus gives us plenty of examples as to how we should do this. For example, Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is a teaching. Take Take the good news of what I have come to do and to give you upon you. The good news is it's not about your work. It's about my work at the cross. You can rest in my work. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn from me and find rest for your weary souls. You know, at another point, Jesus says, if you abide in my words... Then you will be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You you and I, we need to take on his yoke, his teaching, the good news, the gospel message. We take that upon ourselves, and it's freedom. We abide in his words, and it's freedom. 
But what he is saying is this, spend time at my feet. You know, I, I got to tell you, I don't know where you are. I don't know if some of you are out of balance today, but the fact is, if you're not spending time at Jesus' feet, you're going to end up like Martha, distracted and worried and upset. And when you do come to Jesus, it's going to be to push your own agenda instead of spending time at his feet so you can truly learn from him and let him bring you onto his agenda instead of you trying to bring him onto yours. And this is what it is to sit at his feet. This is what it is to learn from him. This is what it is that, in fact, Mary does, Martha struggles to do. So it's like the doorman at Broadway. For 50 years, outside of Broadway, outside, never once going in, dutifully doing his job at that door, never even peeking inside for 50 long years. We can do that also when it comes to spending time with Jesus. We can be at work in a church. I know, I've been a pastor at a church, and never really going in, and never really spending time at his feet. Do you spend time at his feet? Do you spend daily time at his feet? Do you make that a priority? Is that something that's a part of your daily, daily exercise? Number two, sitting at Jesus' feet. Then, then we have falling at Jesus' feet. So here's where we turn to, to the miracle that we're looking at, the raising of Lazarus. And it's in John chapter 11. <clears throat> and I don't want to read the whole passage to you. I can't. But let me just summarize at the beginning of John 11, Mary and Martha, who have a brother named Lazarus, send word to Jesus, Jesus, your good friend, the one that you love, Lazarus, is sick and dying. Come and heal him because we know that you've got the power to heal. And so they send word to Jesus saying, the one that you love is, dead, is dying. And, and what does Jesus do? He, he drops everything and immediately goes. No, he doesn't. He waits. He waits a couple days, in fact, and he doesn't do a thing. In fact, by the time he does get around to going to Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who is now dead, live, it's four days. And, this, and Lazarus has been in the grave. He's been in the tomb for four days by the time Jesus shows up. How do Mary and Martha feel? I mean, they sent word to Jesus. There was plenty of time. He could have made his way there before Lazarus died, but he didn't. Have you ever been disappointed in God? Have you ever been angry with God? Uh, have you ever prayed, and, and, and instead of what you pray for, the opposite happens, and you're just thinking, God, do you even care about me? I mean, I'm, I'm so disappointed in you. I, I'm so upset. I don't even know what to do. I don't know where to go. Well, Mary does, but Martha doesn't. Let, listen to the exchange as we get into this passage. Verse 21, Martha is the first one that knows that Jesus is coming, four days late, but he's coming, and she runs out to meet him meets him face to face and says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, can you hear the anger and the disappointment? If you would have been here, you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Is it okay to feel disappointed with God? A absolutely, but, but Martha is still missing something, and I'll talk about it in a minute. If you would have only been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Not you can do, but God will give you. She still hasn't connected the dots. She still doesn't know that Jesus is, is the life giver himself. And she still doesn't fully know who she's talking to. And so Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. In other words, my hope is in Orthodox Judaism. My hope is not yet in you. I know that there will be a resurrection in the last day. I don't yet know fully who you are. Why does Martha not know who Jesus is fully? Because she hasn't really spent time at his feet. She's too busy. She, she was too busy. She didn't really spend time at his feet. She kind of knew about this. She kind of believed, but, but, well, but struggled to. And then Jesus said this to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. If, any, if the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, notice what Jesus then does to Martha because she's struggling to believe. So Jesus pulls out the, do you really believe this? Do, do you understand I am the resurrection and the life? And when Jesus says, I am, it's ego a me. It's the same time Jesus says, I am, for example, and all the soldiers fall down in John 18. 
or I am the, the, the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It goes back to Exodus 3. It's God's name for himself. I am. My name is I am. Jesus is basically saying, that's me. You know, I, I'm using that name. I, I'm using the name of God from which we get Yahweh. Uh, I am is what Jesus says, the resurrection and the life. Well, Martha struggles to get that. She doesn't yet know that Jesus is life itself, that Jesus is existence, that Jesus is the reason for life itself. She doesn't yet know who she's really looking at when she comes to him, but Mary is different. Verse 32, listen to this. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Says the exact same thing Martha said. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, I'm really, really disappointed in you. But notice what the difference is between Mary and Martha. Did anybody pick it up? Nobody? She fell. She, there we go. She fell at his feet. And there's something very different about the way that Martha came to Jesus and about the way that Mary came to Jesus. She fell at his feet. Basically, she ran up to him and just completely laid down in front of him and just started mourning. And in her grieving, she said, if you would have only been here, my brother would not have died. To fall at his feet is a posture of surrender. It's a posture of humility. It's, it's a posture that says, I don't have anywhere else to go but to right here. I don't have anywhere else to turn but Jesus to your feet. Yes, I'm disappointed in you, but I'm not going anywhere. I am at your feet. She sat at his feet to learn. Here she's falling at his feet to grieve. And she's truly, genuinely mourning. I imagine she's just weeping and sobbing as she says this to Jesus. If you would have only been here, my brother would not have died. Instead of Jesus pushing back on Mary like he pushed back with Martha, calling her to belief, notice what Jesus does. He doesn't say a word. And he just starts bursting out in tears in verse 35. Jesus sees this. He sees Mary falling at, at his feet, and he just starts blubbering. He just starts weeping and sobbing with her, joining her in her mourning. Where do you take, where do you go when you have deep loss? You, you know the deep loss, the, the deep loss of losing someone that you love where you think, I don't know how life's going to go on. Where do you go with that kind of pain? Where, where do you go with the pain of deep sorrow? Where do you go with the pain of deep anguish and deep grief? Where do you go with, with the words cancer? You know, wh where do you go with, with the, 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 the divorce papers that were handed to you? Wh where do you go with the, the fact that now you know something has taken place that is going to turn your life upside down? Where do you go with that? What, what do you do with that? For a lot of us, if we get really honest, instead of going to the feet of Jesus, we go to the bottle or to a pill. Uh, and, and we try to numb the hurt that we feel. A lot, of, a lot of addictions basically started out with people genuinely grieving and mourning and didn't know where to go with their pain, and so they turned to something that then became an addiction. And a lot of us are here, and that's where we've gone, and we still are dependent on a chemical or on something because we haven't really known where to go with the hurt and the pain and the sorrow, and we haven't known where to go with it. Or a lot of us, well, here's, here's what we might do with the pain and the hurt and the sorrow. We just pour ourselves into getting busy, and we just start doing more and doing more and doing more because we don't want to stop and think about the hurt. We don't want to stop and think about the pain, so we just become a Martha. And we just, we get our to-do list and we don't, we don't stop until we go, until our head hits the pillow at night and even then we start processing our to-do list for the next day because we don't, we don't want to think about this. And in our busyness, we still don't fall at the feet of Jesus. In our busyness, we still don't go to him to grieve and to mourn. You know, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. What, what he is saying is this. Every one of us has to mourn both sin and the effects of sin in our life. That the sin that we have that keeps us from God, we've got to grieve that. We've got to mourn it. But then we also have to mourn the effects of sin. Death, violence, destruction, 
stuff that turns our lives upside down and we don't know where to go for, with it, we have to also bring that to him. We have to genuinely mourn it. We have to feel it and reveal it. And the only place to do that is at the feet of Jesus. But notice the promise. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, th there is a comfort as you and I come to the feet of Jesus to mourn, that we're not going to find in a chemical, that we're not going to find in an activity, that we're not going to find in busyness, that we're not going to find in another person. We're only going to find in Him. It's a peace. It's a calm. It's a healing that only He can give and we only receive as we throw ourselves upon Him by faith. This is what it is to fall at His feet. Now, but before I move on, th think for a little bit about the fact that Jesus weeps. You know, wh why, why in the world does Jesus burst out in tears? A, a couple minutes from bursting out in tears, he's about to call Lazarus out of the grave, and Lazarus is going to walk out of the grave, and, and everybody's going to be completely floored, and there's going to be rejoicing. Why is Jesus weeping, knowing that there will be rejoicing in just a few minutes? He's showing us the very real need to grieve our losses. A lot of us, we super spiritualize this and we say, you know what, I know that my loved one is in a better place. I know that, uh, I know that things will be okay. We know that in our heads, but we fail to grieve and we fail to mourn. And instead of going to the feet of Jesus, we, we, we kind of intellectually cling to some things in our head, but we never grieve. And we never mourn. And Jesus shows us, I know there's nothing to worry about. I'm just going to call someone out of the grave in a few minutes, but I'm going to mourn. What do we do with our pain? We have to bring it to the feet of Jesus. And some of us, quite frankly, haven't done that. And because of that, like Martha, we're distracted. We're upset. We're worried. We're anxious. We haven't learned to be at the feet of of Jesus. We haven't learned to go there. We haven't learned to fall at his feet. And well, the, the story is not quite over. So Jesus says, where have you put him? As, as he starts weeping, he says, where, where, where have you laid him? And, and they said, well, his tomb is over here. They take Jesus to the tomb where everyone else is gathered around. And Jesus says this. <laughs> he says, take away the stone. But Lord, Martha, now Martha chimes in. She hasn't said anything, but now she chimes in. Martha said, Lord, by now there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, I've got to stop here real quick, because notice that Martha is trying to block a miracle. Notice that Martha is trying to tell Jesus, no, you don't want to open that tomb. Yeah, you don't want to. Martha's absolutely right. According to natural law, after four days, something happens to the body. It's called putrefication. It's not a good thing, and it does smell. But she doesn't realize that standing right beside her is the resurrection and the life. And she doesn't realize who he yet is. And because of that, why does she not realize that he's the resurrection and the life? Let me get real honest. She's never sat at his feet. She's never fallen at his feet. She hasn't learned. She hasn't understood. She intellectually knows something, but in her heart she doesn't know it. If you and I don't, don't sit at his feet and fall at his feet, we can believe everything about Jesus, but we don't really put our trust in him. You see, th th this is where it goes from the natural to the supernatural. There are natural laws. Yes, the body does decay after four days. It doesn't smell very nice. That's the natural law, but Jesus is a supernatural God. And he is about to call Lazarus out of the grave. And, and, and Martha is trying to block the miracle. You and I, if we don't spend time sitting at his feet, falling at his feet, we will block miracles in our life. And maybe even for others. And say, you know what, God, God, can't, God can't interrupt the natural course of things. There's no way. You know, intellectually, we know that he's got the power, but, but in our heart, we struggle. Do you struggle? And if you do struggle, let me call you back to points number one and two. You know, let, let me call you back to what Mary does. But notice what Jesus says to Martha. Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? He doesn't say, did I not tell you that if you saw, you would believe? He says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see? He's calling Martha to be more like Mary. 
to choose the one thing that's important, to sit at his feet, to fall at his feet, because that's where belief is forged. If you're struggling to believe, that's where belief is forged, at the feet of Jesus. Well, number three, worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Let's jump ahead to John chapter 12, and it's just a short time later. Now there's a family reunion at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who has been called out of the grave. And, and, and by the way, Jesus then says, Lazarus, come forth, <laughs> you know? And, and I wonder what, what would have happened if Jesus wouldn't have mentioned the name Lazarus. If Jesus would have just been there and he would have said, come forth, you know? Then all of a sudden you have everybody, I think, coming out of the grave. But instead he pinpointed it, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walks out. Well, now there is a reunion at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Can, can you imagine the joyful reunion? This guy who was dead for four days, he's now alive. Now they're having a party at, at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And that, that's where we pick up in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And by the way, they're plotting to kill this poor guy. I mean, it's, it's, it's not good to be Lazarus at this point, but, but, but they're having fun at the house. Here at the dinner uh, was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Can you imagine just the joy that's going on here in this house. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You're thinking, what, what's going on? Well, let, let, me, let, let me bring you into it. Mary is back at Jesus' feet. She's learned at Jesus' feet. As she sat there, she has mourned at Jesus' feet when she fell down in front of him. And now she's at Jesus' feet yet again. This time she's worshiping at Jesus' feet. She, she hasn't budged. She knows where to go. She's right back at the feet of Jesus, and she's worshiping. And let me make four points, four truths about worship, and then I want to talk about Martha. But four truths about worship. First of all, worship is a way of life. Worship isn't just the songs that we sing when we walk in here on Sunday. It's not. Worship is a way, literally, of living at the feet of Jesus. It starts when we sit at his feet and learn from him, and then it continues as we fall at his feet and grieve in him, and then it continues as we worship at his feet. This, this is what worship is. It's an outflow of living at his feet. Why do we struggle to worship? If you struggle to worship, chances are you're not sitting and falling at the feet of Jesus. And, and, and your faith is maybe up here in the intellectual realm. Paul puts it this way. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, I am praying that the eyes of your heart might be opened. The word open is edo. Or, I mean, the, you might know. The word know is edo. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart might be opened so that you might know edo, which means to experience that you might experience both the hope and the power that is in Christ. He's talking to Christians saying, you're living with your eyes of your heart shut. And the eyes of your heart are shut, and you still haven't fully experienced the hope and the power, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. And, and why, why is the church at Ephesus not experiencing the hope and the power? Because, because they aren't spending time at Jesus' feet. They aren't falling at his feet. They aren't worshiping at his feet. Everything is up there in their heads, but it hasn't moved its way into their lives. Is it there for you? Or are you at Jesus' feet? Uh, and, and that's what worship is. It's an outflow of being at Jesus' feet. And, and why do we worship? I remember asking my mom when I was a kid, and I think I got her a little upset. Mom, does God have a low self-image that we have to worship him? I mean, I remember thinking, of, we, why do we worship God? Why do we sing praises to God? I mean, is God up there thinking, praise me, praise me? Absolutely not. God doesn't need our praises. God doesn't need our worship. We need to worship. Worship means to value something above all. That's what worship means. We all will value something above everything else. To worship Jesus means to value him above anything else. We, we value him above a football team. We value him above our bank account. We value him above our reputation. We value him above our relationships. We value him above everything else. And that's why we are worshiping at his feet, because he is our object of highest value. 
Nothing else matters. And that takes us to the second truth about worship. It's sacrificial. Notice what she does. She takes what she has of highest value, which is this perfume, this pure nard, and according to commentators, as they start looking at what perfume was in the day, it was, to, it was basically her own burial spice. This was probably what she bought to ensure her own, that, that her family wouldn't have to pay for her burial. And she was buying her own burial anointment spices because that's something that they would do. And according to commentators, it probably cost the equivalent of about thirty, thirty-five thousand $35,000 in today's money. So what does Mary do? She goes into her house. She takes the very thing that's worth the most that she owns. It's not even her house. It's Martha's house. She probably doesn't own a house. The only thing she owns that's of worth value is this perfume. And what does she do? She goes and she breaks it on Jesus' feet. What's she doing? She is saying, Jesus, compared to you, I have nothing of value. This, this that I have a value, I, I willingly give it to you. As a matter of fact, uh, now that I have you, I'm not even worried about my death. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I, I bought this for my, for my death that, that, I might be, uh, that, that it might be anointing my body after I'm dead. I don't need this because I've got you. And she breaks it all over Jesus' feet. And it's a sacrifice and it's a giving. Uh, worship also is, it, it flows out of gratitude. Lazarus is sitting there, and there's this gratitude that's coming up inside of Mary as she worships Jesus. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, worship, when we truly get it, it's like a sweet aroma for others. When we live a life of worship and we are literally living at the feet of Jesus, other people will see it and be inspired. And our worship, our living life before the feet of Jesus, it inspires other people to do the same. David puts it this way, I, my heart will boast in the Lord. Uh, and, he, and he says this in Psalm 34, and let me actually get the actual thing so I don't, so, so I don't read the, the Philip paraphrase. He says this, I, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. The afflicted will hear and rejoice. I like what David is saying. When I live at the feet of Jesus, those who were afflicted, those who were grieving and mourning and have nowhere to go, they will know where to go. And, and, and they will bring things to his feet now as well. And they will learn from his feet as well. And they will, and they will worship as well. It, it will be contagious. Worship is contagious. Now let me talk about Martha. <laughs> so Mary, Mary is worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Go back and try to find out what Martha's doing. John chapter 12, 1 through 3, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Let me just stop there. Martha is back being busy. Now, serving isn't bad. It's good. But when serving replaces being at his feet, it's bad. And for Martha, that's what it is. She is serving. She is, she's never really grieved. She's never really learned at his feet. And now she's busy again. And again, she's not at the feet of Jesus. And you and I can so easily become like Martha. We can so easily be like that doorman outside of Broadway who for 50 years never goes in. We can so easily get caught up in doing that we forget to be. We as a church can easily create Martha's. So, so, you know, putting, putting people to doing so that they forget to be. So this week, I, I got an email, and, and it's from Mindy Byington. She's an artist in our church. And Mindy sent me a drawing that she had done, and that's the drawing up on screen. And I was like, and I emailed her back, and I said, Mindy, you have no idea that, that I'm preaching on this passage this week. Can I, can I share this? And I said, Mindy, what prompted you to send that drawing to me? And, uh, and so Mindy wrote these words about the drawing of Mary at Jesus' feet right up there on the screen. She said this, when I drew this, the Lord was dealing with me to let go of everything else in my life, any preconceived plans, spiritual and otherwise, to stop worrying that I would miss his direction to mess up. I felt he kept showing me the most important thing that he wanted was my attention focused on him to let go of everything else because he's got it covered. As I was working on this drawing, I kept, myself, I kept feeling myself pulled just to humbling myself before him, letting his mighty hand do its job 
in my life. Yeah, she gets it. That's, that's it. It's, it's about being there. It's about being at the feet of Jesus. It's about learning at his feet. It's, it's about grieving and falling at his feet. It's about worshiping at his feet. And here's what I want us to do as we close. I, I want us to spend some time at the feet of Jesus. And that might mean you are just going to stand and you're going to sing and you're going to sing out. It might mean that you just come up on your own and you just pray and you spend some time up here. Or it might mean that you come and let someone pray with you. What is it that you need to bring to him? I'm going to ask the pastors and the elders who were in here, as I have every, every week during this message to do, to go ahead and come up front and to be in a place where you can be prepared to pray. And, and as I do that, I want to ask you, do you need to be at Jesus' feet? It could just mean you're going to stand and sing or pray, or it could mean you come forward. It could mean that you lay something down and someone prays with you. It could mean that you say, I need Jesus to intervene in my life. I need a miracle. It could mean that you come with your own disappointment and you say, you know what, I need to express my disappointment, but I do so falling at the feet of Jesus. Wh whatever it is, would you stand with me as we close? Lord God, some of us need to spend time at your feet. Through your spirit, show us exactly what to do. Some of us need to be prayed over. Some of us need to worship. Others of us need to spend time with you. Lord God, may we end truly being at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen.